Hi, everybody. It's Jeff from Ayelet Tours. And since 1986, we've been connecting people to Israel and the Jewish world. We are together hey, today. Hey, Jeff. 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 Daron. Daron, I'm, I'm in the middle. We're live. I'm, I'm in the middle of Jeff, the introduction. Where, where are you? Where are you, Jeff? Um, I'm out for a trail ride. I'm, pro I'm getting ready for the ride for the living. Where, where's your bike? My bike's right there. Isn't that a, a little kid's bike? No. Why do you have a, a basket? Oh, that's that's where I put my uh, my snacks and my uh, my drinks and stuff. And you have a little flowery bell. Well, yeah, that's uh, for safety. Okay. Well, I can see you're also prepared for the ride. Uh, that, of course, is Daron Epstein, our uh, our man in Europe, who is wearing his Ride for the Living jersey. We're very proud to have supported the Ride for the Living with the Krakka JCC. This is our third year in a row as an official sponsor. And, of course, uh, today's, uh, today's tour of the, the Jewish uh, ghetto in Krakow is going to be a bit heavy, uh, but... Uh, but the tour itself is uh, is something that's uh, maybe not light, but certainly uplifting. It's something uh, that we're very proud to be a part of. And uh, for those of you that are interested, of course, this is a free tour. But if you'd like to support the work of the Krakow JCC, uh, Daron will put the link uh, into the chat uh, for uh, for our ride page. And we, we certainly appreciate uh, any support that uh, people are, are willing to offer. Uh, with that, we're going to go to Krakow, Poland, where Anya uh, is standing by. Uh, Anya, will you be riding this year for the Ride for the Living? Yes, of course. Welcome, everybody. I am going to participate in Ride for the Living this year, as I did already five uh, times, and every single time, uh, doesn't matter if it was an actual ride or a virtual ride, it was such an amazing experience. It was such an amazing opportunity to get fit, to feel better, and of course, to support the Krakow Jewish community. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, I can see you've already got your bicycle there as well. You're ready to go. Oh yeah, everything is, I'm ready to go. As soon as it's stopped raining, I'm going. <laughs> Perfect. All right, well, with no further delay, I will turn it over to you for our tour today. And uh, thank you very much, of course, for being with us. And uh, we're looking forward to the tour. Thank you. Thank you very much. At the very beginning of our tour, I just want to uh, introduce myself uh, a little bit. My name is Anna Maria Baryła, and I'm a professional licensed tour guide here in Krakow, uh, Poland. And uh, well, I studied Jewish studies at the Jagiellonian University, as well as cultural studies. And I have about seven years of experience in guiding groups from all over the world. And I do specialize in uh, Jewish history of Poland and Polish-Jewish uh, relations. So this is really what my biggest passion is, talking about the history of Polish Jews and the relation between Poles and Jews. And actually also you know, learning more about current situation, explaining the current situation of Jews living in Poland. Today we'll be talking about a very difficult uh, time uh, from the history of Polish Jewish community. We'll be talking about the time of the Nazi occupation of Krakow, and especially we are going to focus on the history of Krakow ghetto. Today, during this tour, we'll be all together walking down the street of what once was the Jewish ghetto of Krakow. I will be talking about the most important dates, the most important events, but uh, of course, I will be talking about stories of people. I will be talking about inhabitants who lived in Krakow ghetto. I will be talking about those who were deported, who never came back, about those who survived. And uh, with no further ado, I want to start with a little bit of uh, historical introduction. We can actually get a little closer to the map, which you probably can already uh, see uh, behind me. And uh, I want to start with key words about the situation of Krakow at the very beginning of the Nazi occupation. Because of course, Krakow was invaded um, 6th of September, 1939. War started 1st of September, 1939. So it took them only six days, six days for Wehrmacht to get to Krakow, to enter the city of Krakow. And that was the very beginning of the occupation. 
Of course, the city of Krakow and people here were preparing themselves for what was about to happen. Before the war, the army was uh, created here in Krakow, the unit of a bigger army called the Krakow Army. Young people, soldiers were arriving to Krakow and they were getting ready to fight um, for freedom of their country and of their city. But as soon as Nazis invaded Poland, it became quite clear during the first couple of days or weeks that Poles are not going to win this war. The Nazis are much stronger, that their army is just stronger than Polish army. And that's why the mayor of the city of Krakow made very hard, very difficult decisions. And he decided to uh, give up. The uh, Krakow army was sent away from uh, the city to the eastern part of Poland to fight there. And what about uh, the citizens who stayed? Well, the city became an open city. So when Nazis entered September 6, 1939, there were white flags everywhere and Krakow was there. So from the very, very beginning of the occupation, Nazis made Krakow their own city. The first thing they did, they put flags everywhere. Swastikas were all over the place. That was a clear information for people here in Krakow. You are now living in a new German city. This wasn't even an occupied city. It was a German city of Krakow. Even the main market square's name was changed from the main square, from the, uh, the main square of the city to Adolf Hitler Platz. And uh, then, of course, other buildings were changing too. So, for example, at the Royal Castle, at the Royal Palace, which once used to be the seat of the Polish king, uh, new uh, people moved in there. So not only there were Nazi flags, but there were Nazis living in the chambers where once Polish kings lived. No longer the place was called the Wawel Hill. It was called the Krakauerburg. The, one of the main streets of the city, the Royal uh, Street, was uh, called the Reichstrasse. So very, very quickly, Krakow was changing and the life of citizens of Krakow was changing too. First of all, there were many, many new rules for the citizens, for the Polish and for the Jewish, for the Catholic and for the Jewish citizens. Jews had to wear armbands with stars of David. They had to buy them, they had to make them. Jewish people couldn't go to the public areas of the city. They were not allowed on the train station or bus station or libraries or restaurants or shops or they couldn't, couldn't even walk to the main market square of the city. Uh, what were the other rules? Jews couldn't have more than 2,000 lotus on their bank account. They couldn't take more than 500 lotus from their bank account. They couldn't have any private property anymore. No longer they could be owners of shops or the restaurants. So those were the first orders. And there was one more order given to the Jewish people at the beginning of the occupation. They couldn't use Hebrew. No longer prayer was legal for those people. No longer synagogues would function as always. And from the very beginning of the occupation, also Nazis made Jewish people leave the city. They made them leave Krakow, move to the other part of this area of Poland. The main reason for that was that they didn't want Jews in the capital of a new German state established at the area of occupied Poland. They didn't want them in general government. So from September 1939 till May 1940, about 40,000 Jews were forced to leave the city of Krakow. Before the war, there were 68,000 Jews living in the city and they were 25% of all the citizens. And then they made about 40,000 leave. And then uh, those people were going to other parts of Poland, mostly to the east. So in, at the beginning of year 1941, there were about 18,000 um, Jews living in Kazimierz, living in the Jewish district, living in the Jewish quarter, which you can see on the map um, right here. But uh, those people couldn't stay there. They couldn't live there anymore. The Jewish district of Krakow was actually too um, close to the old town. It was too close to the main market square. So that's why 3rd of March, 1941, decision was made to establish the ghetto on the other side of the Vistula River to establish the ghetto in Podgórze district. Why here in Podgórze? Well, first of all, Podgórze, it was always very industrial area. And a lot of factories were here. So of course, Germans knew that this will be the place where people are going to work. Also, it was across the river 
so it was kind of a natural border. So people had to walk from Kajinian district to Podgorze, where the new Jewish living area was established. Now we have the new footbridge here, but the old one uh, was there, uh, the one you can see right now, the blue um, bridge, and that is the Piłsudski, famous Piłsudski bridge, and that was one of the main bridges which Jews were using to move from Kazimierz to the ghetto. So the first reason why ghetto wasn't established in Kazimierz in the Jewish district was that um, it was too close to the, uh, to the main market square. And the second one was, um, as I said, to concentrate those people at the small area where a lot of factories were, where they could work. The name of the ghetto wasn't the Jewish ghetto from the beginning. It was new Jewish living area, new Jewish residential uh, quarter. To make the people think from the very beginning of uh, the situation that they are going to still live in their own area, in their own district. And a lot of those people were actually thinking maybe, maybe this is a good decision. Maybe we should go to the ghetto because we will once again have our own district to live. Maybe no longer we'll be forced to show documents on every street corner. Maybe no longer we'll have to wear those armbands with Paris of David and other people will stare at us and look at us and point their fingers at us. Maybe once again we'll be surrounded by our people. So what those uh, inhabitants of Kajimish were doing, they would pack their things, they would collect their things, they would put their clothes and most valuable things into the suitcases, and they would go across the Vistula River. They would leave their houses or houses where their families lived for centuries and they would go to this new part of the city. And that's how 18,000 people moved to the area where earlier only 3,000 people lived. But what happened with these 3,000 Poles who uh, had, to, had to leave the ghetto, uh, who had to leave Podgorza district? So about 3,000 Polish um, inhabitants of Podgorza were leaving their houses, moving to the Jewish quarter. And the 18,000 Jews were coming here. Some of those people knew each other. Some of those people wanted to exchange houses. But it's not hard to imagine um, that the, well, the mass didn't work. It was impossible to put 18,000 people at the area where only 3,000 people lived before. So that's why in each apartment, in each room, from five up to six, seven, 10, sometimes 12 people were living all together. There were certain rules about how life in the ghetto was supposed to look like. In each room, which had two windows, eight people could live. But when they were counting people, one child, younger than 12 years old, uh, was only half of a person. So very often, as I said, it was eight, 12, 15 people living all together. Conditions of living in the ghetto were extremely, extremely hard. Because uh, the people who were coming here, they were taken away from their own houses. They were taken away from their safe uh, spot, the place where they were living. And they were coming to the place which, well, they knew it, but they didn't choose it as a place for them to live. They were constantly controlled. The wall uh, started to be constructed around the area um, of the ghetto. So they were coming here, they were moving into those buildings. Um, those uh, corridors were extremely crowded. There were people all over the place. And this is how they would um, understand that this was their new reality, that this was the new place where they had to, where they had to live. So when people were entering the ghetto and they were slowly settling in and they were unpacking their suitcases and trying to start their new life, all of the adults had to come to the building, which you can see uh, behind me right now, so-called Arbeitsam, the employment service. Because it was very important for those people to prove that they could work, that they were able to work. So every single person who entered the ghetto after they settled in, in their house had to stand in a long line in front of this yellow building. And they were entering the room, big room with few desks standing against the wall. And at, it, at each desk, there was either a guard uh, or a doctor or a nurse. And those people were supposed to do the test. If those people who were entering were young enough, if they were strong enough, if they were able to work, and if they were, what actually they could do. So during those first deportations from Krakow at the beginning of the, uh, of the occupation, while well, they were sending away people who were members of intelligentsia, 
no longer they needed lawyers, no longer, no longer they needed doctors, well-educated people. They needed workers, construction workers, electricians, those strong people who could work at the factory. So every single person coming to Arbeit Camp wanted to prove we are able to work and we are young and we are strong. So at the beginning, when they were entering the ghetto, it wasn't that hard. It was, of course, already really hard part of their life. But um, after a couple of weeks, after a couple of months, they were getting weaker. There were old people who were more and more sick, who were no longer able to prove that they were able to work. So there was a big black market um, here in the ghetto. People would pay really a lot of money for black hair dye to dye their gray hair and to prove, well, look, we are still young, we still can do it. People would put on a lot of layers of clothing to look bigger and healthier and stronger. They would very often rub their cheeks before they entered uh, the building to once again look healthier than they actually than they actually were. This was also the place of hope, because if these people got the special documents which prove that they are able to work, if they got this stamp in their newly um, in the new ID which they got when they were entering the ghetto, well, they were allowed to stay. So at the very beginning, when the ghetto existed, people had to come here every four weeks to renew their permission to work. And where they could work? Well, they could work, as, as I said, as construction workers, or they could work in the factory. They could work in good or bad factories. They could work in the quarry, for example, where you know, for 12 hours a day, they had to work extremely hard, or they could work in the nice place, in a sewing factory, where they were given food every single day, where they were treated like human beings. But very often, it was just a coincidence. Nobody cared if those people could work or not, and how hard they could work, because, you know, one person was out, one person was sick, no longer was able to work. There were five, six, ten other people waiting to take the spot of this one who couldn't work. What was happening to those people who were getting sick? Well, there were, of course, also hospitals in the ghetto. Let's start walking um, uh, right now together um, towards um, another important building in the ghetto, which was actually a hospital. Well, you can already see it, the pink building at the end of the street. It's something very unusual that so many institutions were here in Krakow's ghetto, that there was this very clear structure of how this ghetto was functioning. There was not only Arbeitsam, there were not only hospitals. There was also this institution called Judenrat. And those are people who were chosen. Yes, they were the Jews who were supposed to work with the Germans, who were supposed to coordinate everything what was happening in the ghetto. And when that was created, Judenrat, they um, wanted to be sure that a lot of orders are going to be submitted by those members of Juden, that those who are here in the ghetto are going to follow the orders because they are going to hear them from people they already knew. So Juden was functioning here in Krakow ghetto. There was Arbeitsam, there was a Jewish social welfare or self-help organization, and there was also a hospital. There was actually more than one hospital here in Krakow ghetto. And it was also create this idea, this vision, of this ghetto being just better than the other ghetto. But this ghetto was the place where you know, people could uh, live in a, in a very normal way. But this ghetto was the place where they could go to Arbein Farm and find a job. If they felt sick, they could go to the hospital. Why it looked so good, why it looked so well? Because Krakow's ghetto was a ghetto in the capital of general government. Yes, about other cities, Nazis didn't care that much. But this city was visited by Heinrich Himmler. This ghetto was visited by Josef Goebbels. So definitely everything had to look right and everything had to look well. So we will be walking during the tour down the street called Josefinska. There were three main streets of the ghetto. There is Josefinska Street, there was Limanovskiego Street, and there was also um, Renkowski Street three most important streets in Krakow yet. On Józefińska Street, there were a lot of those institutions I was talking about. Limanowskiego was the main one with trams going back and forth, with shops. Still, you know, looks 
like a street in a regular city. And then there was also Renkavka Street, the only green part of this area, of, of the ghetto, where people would go for a walk. And actually, if you would look behind me right now, um, there is another street called Vengierska. And Vengierska Street was crossing all the three other important streets of the ghetto. So Yuzefinska, and then, uh, and then uh, Limanovskiego, and then Renkavka. So what about conditions of living? Uh, here of people in, uh, in Krakow's ghetto. Conditions of living were extremely hard. As I said, uh, people uh, had to work very hard 12 hours a day. Per person per day, it was only 250 up to 300 calories. Every person from age of 12 to age of 65 uh, was considered a worker. So people were leaving their houses early in the morning, coming back late at night. And those were young parents with children. They had to find somebody to take care of their baby. When I studied Jewish studies, we uh, read a lot of uh, journals, a lot of diaries of those people who were living here in the ghetto. Some of them were children. Some of them were teenagers. And this is how one of them, Roma Ligotka, was uh, writing about her life in the ghetto. I'm constantly surrounded by a crowd of people at home, in kitchen, and in the large dark room where my grandma sits calmly at her sewing machine working, and where my cot is too, in that room that we share with strangers, a different family lives in every corner of the room. There is no bathroom. Everyone keeps using the clock toilet in the staircase. So we had those memories of people who are here. It was their everyday, everyday life. For two years, when Krakow Ghetto existed, from 1941 till 1943, those streets, those old buildings, those places which looked so hopeless when you would enter this area, this was home of many during the time of the occupation, during the time when this ghetto existed. And still here in Krakow, we are able to see those houses. We are able to see those original buildings of the ghetto. But of course, even if the life of people was really, really hard, it doesn't mean that people couldn't organize themselves. We know that there were restaurants uh, in such a ghetto or cafes, at least at the beginning when this ghetto existed. We know that there were um, um, religious organizations, that they were still, that there were still Orthodox people living here, that they would manage to get the kosher food, that they were celebrating holidays, that they were celebrating uh, Shabbat or Passover. We know that even later in year 1943 and 1944, in a labor camp here in Krakow, people were baking um, uh, masa for Passover. So even if the situation was hard and people were really, really desperate, they were still here and uh, they were trying at least to live their life. I was already talking about those journals, about those diaries of those girls who are living here, those young girls who are living here and writing about how before the war they were complaining that every single day they had so many classes that they had to learn French and English um, uh, and, and, and German and then they had piano classes and they had to go to school and there were so many things parents would organize for them and how much they missed them. How every single day in the ghetto was exactly the same. That they would wake up already so hungry. That they were... Um, uh, excuse me for a moment. Okay, sorry, we had some technical difficulties. That they were waking up in the morning and that they were already hungry. That every single day was exactly the same. That they were constantly bored that they were trying to find some joy in their life, but it was really, really difficult. For a moment, let's have a look at this uh, building here um, behind me. It's Yusefinska Street number uh, 13. Uh, here in Yusefinska Street, in this, uh, in this building on the first floor, was the seat of the unit of the Jewish fighting organization, where uh, young uh, Jews, those who were members of many Zionist organizations before the war would organize themselves. And probably you heard about the uprising in Warsaw Ghetto. You probably heard about Warsaw Uprising. 
uh, there was no uprising here in Krakow's ghetto. But it doesn't mean that people weren't organizing themselves, that they weren't fighting. Jewish fighting organization here in uh, Krakow, together with a uh, Polish fighting organization in year 1942, organized the famous Tiganeria action. Tiganeria was the name of the restaurant in the city center of Krakow. And there were hand grenades and bombs put in that restaurant and 12 German officers were killed. Thanks to the cooperation of these two underground military, uh, military groups. So once again, just to sum up what I already said, we had those people coming to the ghetto. We had them firstly being shocked with how their new life is going to look like and then slowly organizing themselves, finding jobs, um, going to work every day, uh, are trying to look for care for their children, uh, uh, organizing some cultural and religious events, and even trying to fight. And as soon as some of those people started to think that maybe their life is going to continue, came year 1942 and first deportation. We'll be walking now towards the main square of the ghetto, the square which, which is called the square of the heroes of the ghetto. But before the war, it was called the Agreement Square. And it was just one of the squares of Podgorze. And that was the main square of deportation. But before deportations in Krakow Ghetto actually happened, um, the famous conference in Van Zee took place uh, at the beginning of year 1942. Close to Berlin, the most important members of the Nazi party decided that European Jewry has to be exterminated. The decision was made that the camps, death camps, extermination camps, labor camps, concentration camps are going to be um, built here at the area of occupied Poland. Of course, the camps, we all know, Auschwitz-Birkenau camp, during that time, during the time of the Second World War, it was the, um, it was the camp at the area of uh, the Third Reich, of Nazi Germany. Here at the area of Poland, of occupied Poland, Nazis uh, created different camps. The one uh, which we are going to hear more about was the camp called the Belgian, close to nowadays Polish-Ukrainian border. There was a camp called Treblinka, where majority of Jews from Warsaw were kept. There was this camp called Heuno, which very often is being called the first death camp. There was the Come to, uh, called Sobibor. Maybe you heard about the famous escape from Sobibor. So all of those uh, big camps were being established here at the area of general government. It was one of the reasons why general government as this new German state was even established to have the place fully controlled by the Nazis where um, the ghettos and camps uh, existed. And in year 1942, first deportations from Krakow ghetto started. There were two big deportations we are going to talk about during this tour. The first one took place in June 1942. But before 5,000 people were sent to the camp called Belzec, there were a gathering of workers at the courtyard of one of the, uh, one of the factories here in the ghetto, just nearby, close to the place where we are now, at the courtyard of famous Optima factory, about seven up to 800 people uh, were gathered. Those people were taken from the street. Those people were being arrested. Those were the people who didn't have permission to work. Sometimes just random people who were walking down the street. And at the courtyard of Optima factory, they all spent about 72 hours. It was June, so extremely hot weather. It was close to 30 degrees. No food, no water, and absolutely no idea what's going to happen to those people. They were sitting there and waiting for the order. There was no shade. There was no place where they, uh, where they could hide. So what happened to those people who were gathered at the courtyard of Optima factory? Eventually, when they were totally exhausted, they all had to walk for about 10 kilometers to the nearest train station. And from that train station, they were sent to the camp called Belzec. And that was the beginning of the first deportation, very famous um, June deportation from uh, from Krakow's ghetto.
And during the deportation, as I said before, about 5,000 people were being sent to Belgium. Why Belgium cut? Belgium is close to the Polish-Ukrainian border. It's about six hours driving from, uh, from Krakow but right now. Why those people were not being sent to Auschwitz if it was just one hour driving from, uh, from the city? So um, Auschwitz camp initially was established as a camp for Polish and Soviet political prisoners. There was no space for Polish Jews over there at the beginning of its existence. And later on, there were Jews from other European countries being sent to Auschwitz. And Polish Jews, uh, Jews from general government to the east. So the deportation in June, 5,000 people slowly were being sent to the train station in Płaszczyk. But before they had to go walk for the 10 kilometers to go to the train station, they had to gather at the square, which we are going to uh, see in a moment. And we are going to be standing at the area of the square. As I said, it was called the Agreement Square or Plat Zgody before the, um, uh, before the war. And later it became some kind of Krakowian Umschlagplatz. You may know this word already because very often it was being used to describe the square of deportation in, uh, in Warsaw. Now it's a big empty square with the monument with 68 chairs standing on it, representing 68,000 uh, Jews who lived in Krakow um, before the war. But as I said, this was place of deportation. So 5,000 people were gathered here and later they all had to walk that direction to the nearest train station. And they were being sent to Belzec, and Belzec camp was very specific. There were no barracks in Belzec. There was absolutely no place where those people could live. And that means one thing. Every single person who left the square and went to that train station was already sentenced to death. This was the place where families were tear apart. This was the place where couples who were in love saw each other for the last time. This was the place where children had to leave their parents. And this was the place where people saw their beloved Krakow for the very last time. They were leaving the city, they were born in, they were leaving the city, they lived during their, their entire life. And they were going towards the unknown. At that point, people didn't know quite well what's gonna happen and where they are going and what life in this new camp is gonna mean. Many of them were thinking that they are going to the labor camp. And they were thinking, well, maybe when we go there, we'll actually be able to work. So we'll prove that we are useful and we'll be able to survive. This is what Nazi propaganda would teach people during the time when they were living in the ghetto and later on. Not without the reason about the entrance to Auschwitz-Birkenau camp, there is the sign which says, work will make you free. For a very long time, the people actually believe that if they are going to work hard enough, they are going to survive. But as I said, those who entered the train going to Belgium, they never came back. And the same happened to another 7,000 people from Krakow Ghetto when they entered this train in October 1942. After these two big deportations from Krakow Ghetto, Ghetto became much uh, smaller. First of all, there were a few streets cut off from the ghetto and the ghetto was divided to two parts. There was ghetto A and ghetto B. Ghetto A for those who could work and ghetto B for those who couldn't work. Later on during the liquidation, uh, during the liquidation of the ghetto, of course, Nazis sent all of those from ghetto B to auschwitz birkenau know, camp and then all of, all of those from ghetto A to Płaszczyk camp. But about Quash's camp, I'm going to tell you more later on. 13 and 14 of March, 1943, on this very square, where so-called liquidation of Krakow ghetto took place. Nazis surrounded the ghetto early morning of March 13, 1943. At that time, there were about 10,000 Jews still living in this area. So the ghetto was surrounded by soldiers, by guards, by Polish police, by Ukrainian police, and inside also Jewish police was coordinating the whole action. There was a huge selection which took place at the area of the square. 2,000 people were sent 
Klaus Fitzgerald now come straightly, and the same day they all ended up in the gas chambers. About 2,000 people were killed here on the square where we are now standing. People who witnessed the liquidation of the ghetto said that there was blood going down the streets of the ghetto. There was absolutely no mercy for those who were still in trouble. And those who were left were sent to Guashu's labor camp. And the name of the camp was the labor camp, but many of those were sent there to die because Guashu's camp was run by among us. It was called the animal or the monster, and you maybe already heard about him. Before we'll continue our journey and our tour uh, to the ghetto, I want to tell you about one more place. Because there was a place of hope in Krakow's ghetto, and it may sound like something absolutely impossible. How in a place like this, where people were dying, when pe where people were being tortured, was any place of hope? Well, here, um, on the corner of the square was the pharmacy, the only functioning pharmacy in, in Krakow ghetto. So it's called the Pharmacy Under the Eagle. The owner of the pharmacy was a young man whose name was Tadeusz Pankiewicz. Tadeusz Pankiewicz um, was Polish and Catholic, and Nazis came to him in 1941, and they offered him a new pharmacy in the city center of Krakow. They said, it's a big pharmacy, better one, closer to the center. You are going to have more clients there. And Pankiewicz said, this was the pharmacy of my father. This is where I want to stay. He bribed the Nazis. He convinced them that he's going to work with them and for them, and they let him stay. And that's how he became the only one uh, person, a uh, non-Jewish person uh, living in the ghetto. He had uh, the small apartment next to the pharmacy, and also he had three co-workers who would come to the ghetto every single day to one of the gates, which was actually nearby the square where we are standing right now. So on a daily basis, Pankiewicz was pretending that he was a grand, great friend of the Germans. He would invite them for dinner to his apartment and he would uh, you know, give them medicine if they wanted. But the truth was he was helping to the Jewish people all the time. He would make fake documents for those who wanted to escape and to go to this non-Jewish Aryan side of the city. He would uh, give people medicine for free if they needed. After the war, Pankiewicz, who, who survived the war, kept getting letters from the people he helped during the time um, when ghetto existed. And the final thing, Pankiewicz very often would give medicine for children to the people who wanted to smuggle them outside from the ghetto. They were being carried outside in a toolboxes um, in the suitcases and garbage bags. And of course, those people who were helping them, you know, to helping their parents to take the children outside from the ghetto, they didn't want them to cry or scream. So Pankiewicz was helping with that as well. Padrush Pankiewicz, after the war, was honored by Righteous Among the Nations Prize. And uh, now his pharmacy is functioning as the little museum. So of course, when you think about Krakow Ghetto, you think about Oskar Schindler, and we are going to talk about him later on. But Tadeusz Pankiewicz is definitely a name to remember. He wrote a book, Krakow Ghetto Pharmacy, his own memoir, which is a great source of knowledge about this ghetto. There were also those diaries, those memoirs written by other people who were here in uh, Krakow Ghetto. So definitely the story of this place, of this square, and the story of Tadeusz Pankiewicz are worth to be remembered. As I said, on this square, we have uh, 68 chairs, and this is part of the monument. In year 2002, this monument was put here. And you may be curious why they decided to use chairs as a part of the monument. Well, actually, after deportations, very often the square was uh, empty. But there were those suitcases laying around, some other belongings which people left behind, and also those empty chairs were standing here, sometimes, you know, people would care, you know, would, would bring them with themselves before the deportation for the elderly people to sit on them. And later on, after the deportation, the square was empty with those empty chairs. And now, of course, they symbolize those who were deported, those who never came back. Now we are continuing our walk towards the last original part of Krakow's ghetto wall. 
we are going to see how the wall of this ghetto uh, looks like. We are going to talk about what happened to those people who are passing through the gate next to this uh, wall. But as we are walking towards the wall, I want to tell you a little bit about this camp, which I mentioned before. Because in Krakow, not only the ghetto existed. In year 1942, the decision was made to create here also a labor camp. And it was very specific labor camp because uh, there were two sub camps in there. One of them for Jewish prisoners and one of them for Polish, let's call them Catholic prisoners, for criminals who were being sent there from the prisons in the city center uh, of Krakow. The commander of that camp, of the Kwasi camp, was man whose name was Amun Gerd. As I mentioned, you may know him, remember him from the movie Schindler's List. He was the one who was shooting the people from the balcony of his villa in Kwasi uh, He was the one who was torturing people. Amun Gerd uh, was actually sent here to Krakow at the beginning of the uh, occupation. Uh, he was sent to Poland at the beginning of the occupation, and uh, he was the one responsible for creating the camp close to the Polish city called Łódź, camp called Majdanek. And uh, later on, he was sent here to Krakow to create the Płaszczy uh, camp, which was only six kilometers away from the area where the ghetto is situated uh, right now. It's only about 10 kilometers from the city center of, uh, of Krakow. So actually very, very close. And uh, the Płaszczyk camp, it started as the labor camp. And later on, it was turned to the concentration camp. We know that at some point, there were those plans to build their staff chamber, to build their crematorium. Uh, that never happened, but the plans were very much there. So when Alan Gerst came to Płaszczyk, he decided that the camp is going to be constructed at the area of two Jewish cemeteries. And they used the tombstones, the Maserot from the Jewish cemetery, to pave uh, the you know, pavement and uh, uh, street road at the area of the Quash Camp. So all of those people who are leaving the ghetto, who are going to the camp, they were walking down the tombstones of maybe people they knew, maybe their ancestors who are buried at those cemeteries. And Washington Camp was functioning till year 1944. People were working in the quarry, working really hard, being tortured. And uh, one of those events which every single person who was in Washington Camp remembers was the liquidation of the orphanage in the camp. Because the orphanage was moved firstly to the ghetto from Kazimierz district. The children who were living in that orphanage, of course, they had to come to the ghetto. They were there, they were here in the ghetto, in the building, which, uh, well, does not exist anymore, but would be right behind me right now. And uh, the orphanage was being moved from one place to another. And eventually some of the children were, during the second deportation in October 1942, some of the children were sent to Belgium. But some of those kids who survived that deportation were sent to the Plash camp. And once again, from the memoirs, we know that Amon Geth played the music, played Yiddish songs while the children were being deported. Not only the children from the orphanage, but, but the children who lived there in the camp with their, with their parents. They would scream and they would cry. And they had to enter those platforms, those uh, trucks, and they were all sent to the death camp. There were so many tragic moments from the history of Krakow's ghetto. There were so many really difficult uh, moments for the people who are, who are here. And actually, in a moment, we are going to see the symbol of uh, how much those people suffered. We are going to see the original fragment of uh, Krakow's uh, Krakow ghetto wall. As I said, this uh, ghetto wall, the construction of it started in April 1942. So ghetto was established uh, in 1941. So ghetto was established in March 1941. And in April 1941, Nazis said, let's build a wall around the ghetto. So those people won't be able to, uh, won't be able to leave. 
And uh, the fragment of the walls you can actually see right now just uh, behind me. We already have, we, we only have two original fragments of the wall which still exist. If you pay attention to the shape of this wall. Well, Nazis, Nazis never said that officially, but it was clear for people who were entering this ghetto. This is the shape of Mateva. This is the shape of a Jewish, uh, of a tombstone from the Jewish cemetery. And this is very clear message sent to the people. You are entering the ghetto, you are entering your own cemetery, and you will never leave this place alive. On this last fragment of the wall, you can see the sign in Yiddish and in Polish. It says, fear lift and we're suffering and, and, and we're dying from the hands of Hitler's murderers. And that was their last way to the death camp. Fragment of uh, the ghetto wall, 1941-1943. So when people were leaving the ghetto, either during the deportation or during the liquidation, they had to cross the street, they had to pass next to this wall, and they were either going to Plaszczyk camp or to Belgium camp or to Auschwitz-Birkenau camp. But among those people who were being deported, among those who were here in, in, in this ghetto, there were also the lucky ones uh, who survived. And who were the lucky ones? Who were those people who were able later on after the war to tell us their story? And we can't talk about those who survived traffic ghetto without mentioning of her shingles to save more than a thousand Jews from Krakow's ghetto. Oskar Schindler came to Krakow in the year uh, 1939, and he saw um, this opportunity to live in Krakow clearly as a business opportunity. He came here and he became an owner of a shop uh, with enameled pots, and then he became the owner of a factory. The factory, which uh, was located not very far away from the place where we are right now, unfortunately during this tour, we won't be able to see this building, but if you ever come to Krakow and, uh, uh, you know, I would love to uh, take you there. The factory is now functioning as a museum of Krakow um, during the Nazi occupation. So Schindler came to Krakow in 1939 and he got the factory and he initially hired Polish workers, but later on he started to hire uh, Jewish workers because it was just cheaper. He wanted to hire those who would work for free. And that is exactly what happened. So till year 1942, people were working, uh, from 1942 to 1944, they were working in a special section of the Schindler factory, maybe 10 minutes away from the place where we are right now. And they were living in the barracks, constructed for the factory. And this is why more than a thousand people were saved by Schindler because he had those people who were working for him living at the area of the factory. And now of course the big question is why? Why he had those people um, you know, working for him and living there and why he saved them? There are so many different stories and theories about Oscar Schindler. Was he a good person or an opportunist? Did he really want to save those people and was their friends or he maybe saw this opportunity for him after the war to survive thanks to those who were saved by him? We'll never know the actual answers to this question. But let me tell you about few numbers. There were 68,000 Jews who lived in Krakow before the war. Only 3,000 survived the war. And one third of all of the survivors from Krakow were saved by this one man, by the first and I had this amazing opportunity to guide some of the children or grandchildren of survivors from famous Schindler list. And I would always ask them, what your parents, what your grandparents were saying about Schindler? And what do you think about Oscar Schindler? And one of the most moving stories I've ever heard was about the girl, this young woman I guided a couple of years ago, and she said, you know what? People say that Schindler was just an opportunist. But she says, my grandfather, who walked me down the aisle on my wedding day. So I really don't care if you did it for money or fame or just to feel better. The quote from Talmud says, whoever saves one life, saves the world entire. That is exactly what Oscar Schindler did. So this story, the story of Krakow's ghetto, it's 
a difficult story. It's mostly the story of, uh, of death and of suffering of thousands of people who are here. But I would love to tell you one story, one story of a, of a survivor I've met. His name is Marcel Zielinski. And Marcel Zielinski was born in Krakow before the war. His father was a very talented man, religious man. Together with his family, Marcel lived very close to the Vavel field. Beautiful area, beautiful neighborhood. When the occupation started, Marcel was moved to Kazimierz district, to the Jewish quarter. Then in 1941, with the entire family, they went to the ghetto. And then when the ghetto was liquidated in 1943, they walked past that wall, which we saw, to Płaszczyk camp. But when Płaszczyk camp was liquidated in November 1944, his entire family ended up in auschwitz birkenau camp. Of course, they were all separated. Marcel and his dad were in a men's camp, and his mother went to the camp for women. They were very lucky because they got to Auschwitz when gas chambers were no longer functioning. But unfortunately still, Marcel's father suffered from, from some disease and died. Marcel was alone. He was 10 years old in auschwitz birkenau camp, alone, no idea where his mother was. When in January 1945, Auschwitz Birkenau camp was liberated by Soviets. Marcel and some other, other kids decided to go back to Krakow. They walked. Sometimes, you know, somebody would take them to a car, like Russian soldiers, for example. They slept in barns. Some villagers would help them. And when they eventually got to Krakow, a bunch of kids, they were taken to the Jewish orphanage. Marcel spent a couple of months in that orphanage. And a miracle happened because his mother, who survived Auschwitz, found him there. Later on, they moved from Krakow to another Polish city called Wrocław, and soon from Wrocław to Israel, where Marcel started his family. Later on, together with his wife, Marilla, they moved to Canada. During his entire life, Marcel was a very talented engineer, but his biggest passion was riding his bike. Can you imagine that a couple of years ago, Marcel read in some article that here in Krakow in Poland, a Jewish community center is organizing a bicycle ride. Bicycle ride, ride which basically follows the same path he went when he was a child, from Auschwitz to Krakow. Marcel is over, is over 80 years old now, and he completed three uh, rides for the living, and he's dedicated to do the global challenge this year as well. Let me tell you the moment of leaving Auschwitz-Birkenau camp on your bike and just riding next to somebody who left that place in 1945 is the most powerful experience I've ever had in my entire life. I think experiences like this give me strength to guide in the places like Krakow Ghetto or Płaszów uh, camp. And I hope you learned something new during the tour. And I hope you also find some, uh, find some inspiration. Inspiration which we can always learn from the survivors, from those who gave us the more value, valuable lessons. Thank you so much for joining me today. Anya, thank you for taking the time and sharing with us your, your, your expertise. Your, your passion and your incredible presentation. I'm sure I'm not the only one that's that's moved by uh, this incredible tour today. And, and hopefully not the only one that's inspired that if we've learned nothing from the past, it's that we need to take actions. We need to be responsible for, for the actions that we take in trying to build a better future and a better tomorrow. And that's one of the reasons that we're so, so proud to partner with the Krakow JCC in rebuilding Jewish life in Poland today. Uh, and why we're so proud to, to partner as part of the Ride for the Living as a, a, an official partner. Uh, Daron, if I can just ask you to repost in the, in the chat uh, the link, if people would like to make a donation to the, the Krakow JCC's Ride for the Living, uh, our team, uh, certainly thank there it is. Thank you very much. Um, and of course, we've got uh, we've got time now. Uh, Anya is still with us for a little while. If people have questions, there is the Q and A function within 
the, uh, the Zoom webinar. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask any questions if people have them. Uh, if there's no questions, of course, uh, uh, we can move on. I will just as long as we've got a little time, uh, if people want to post questions there uh, before we do. We always have virtual programs coming up. Of course, we're very much looking forward to future trips. Uh, we always, already have uh, trips on the books and uh, uh, Professor Stephen Burke, of course, will go with our traveling university back to Eastern Europe and we'll meet with Anya in Krakow for a live tour. That's summer 2022. Uh, in the meantime, of course, we've got our virtual programs coming up in June. Uh, Professor Burke will be talking about Zion in America and what a, uh, an important time to talk about it. Things, uh, as we all know, have been a little uh, difficult these, these last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, so it's gonna be a very, um, a very timely conversation with Professor Burke. Uh, in addition, we have a program on the 10 commandments today, uh, the way that uh, the 10 commandments uh, can impact you in your personal life. Information for both of those programs, of course, are on our website, ayelet.com. So with that, uh, I'll just check and see. I think we've got a few questions coming in. It looks like maybe in the uh, chat. Oh, people were asking uh, if we could just get a spelling of the name of the Krakow ghetto. Uh, it's a little just an, it, 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 how, how do you spell the name of the, the Krakow ghetto? Well, the, the Krakow ghetto, the name was just like um, a Jewish residential quarter or the Jewish living area. It didn't have a particular name. The name I was talking about was the camp called Plashov Camp, which is P L A um, S V O W. Okay. All right. Well, I, believe it or not, I have no questions coming in, which meant, which means that your presentation was so clear and so perfect. This is what what uh, my my history teacher would always say. He'd say, "You're all honor students. Nobody has a question because the, my presentation was so good." Uh, but uh, we, we, we thank you uh, so deeply for this, this tour today and the time that we've spent together. Uh, again, uh, we mm -hmm. encourage everybody, either through the link that Jerome posted or on our website, there's also a link to make a donation in support of the Krakow JCC and this year's virtual ride for the living. And I hope uh, that the day will come very soon that we're, we're once again together in person and I look forward to it. Anya, thank you. Thank you so much. I just wanted to add once again, if like anybody will come up with any questions or suggestions or like would like to get some suggestions about, I don't know, books or uh, movies or any other types of sources about Krakow's ghetto or in general, Krakow's history uh, or history of Krakowian Jews, I am here. I will uh, be very happy to answer your questions, to answer your uh, emails and uh, yeah, I want to thank you uh, so much for joining uh, today. I know that the virtual tour is not the same with the real tour, but we are doing our best here. And I hope you had a really nice uh, time, you know, listening to this uplifting stories that you had a meaningful time listening to those uh, soft stories. And I hope that, uh, well, what we are trying to do, to do here in Krakow together with the JCC it's going to stay with you uh, a little longer. Thank you so much. All right. Be well. Shalom. It's Jeff from Ayala Tours. Hope you enjoyed that video. Remember to catch all of our creative content by subscribing to our YouTube channel.